colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, students, but most importantly, Ismet and your family, welcome tonight's combination inaugural lecture and Kenneth and me memorial lecture. So I'll introduce the two elements of tonight's lecture separately. So the Kenneth Finley Memorial Lecture celebrates the life and achievements of the late Kenneth Finley, who was a supporter of the UNSW at the time of his death in the mid-1990s when he was CEO of Exxon Coal and Minerals. Ken was a person of genuine commitment for improving safety in the Australian mining industry. The seminars Ken presented to the final year mining engineering students were extremely effective in shaping their attitudes towards safety in the mining industry and in developing an awareness of their responsibilities and roles in regard to safety. <coughs> the Kenneth Finley Memorial Lecture was established in 1995, so today is the 10th anniversary, in recognition of Ken's pioneering work in leadership in improving safety. The lecture is delivered in September, October of each year and is open to students, alumni and people associated with the mining lecture. And tonight, we have not only the Kenneth Finley Memorial Lecture, but we've been almost uniquely able to combine it with Ismet's inaugural professorial lecture. So, the second bit of the introduction. Inaugural professorial lectures are a long tradition of universities. We wear our gowns as celebration of the medieval guilds from where universities originated, and inaugural lectures started at about the same time in the early medieval universities. And they were a chance to mark the passage from apprentice to master, and they were designed to celebrate that very significant milestone in somebody's career. And indeed, they have kept that milestone celebration, celebrating the transition to professor, the highest rank within the university system. So tonight, above all else, is a chance to celebrate. We've taken that old tradition and brought it to UNSW. There are some traditions associated with inaugural lectures that we haven't kept going, and I do wonder whether we should. So when they were first established, there was a lot of responsibility on the lecturer, but not just to deliver a really good lecture. They were expected to entertain, for about a week, the entire college. And after a successful week of entertaining, in Oxford, in the mid I think 15th century, they had to preside over disputations within the college for the next 40 days. And that one, I'm absolutely delighted. So I can hand over to you for the next 40 days, all disputes about HR, parking, and food. It's over to you. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So with that little bit of background, tonight really is a celebration of Ismet's career to date. So I'm gonna have to put my glasses on this to make sure I get it absolutely right. So, Ismet received his BSc in Mining Engineering from Istanbul Technical University. He then moved to South Africa and worked for the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, where he was Research Area Manager in the Rock Engineering Program. He obtained his MSc Mining Engineering degree from the University of Witzwurstrand and a PhD from the University of Victoria. After 10 years in research, he moved to consultancy and worked for Groundwork Consulting and later for Golder Associates in Australia as principal engineer. In 2008, Ismet joined Anglo-American Coal in Brisbane, where he was the principal geotechnical engineer for underground operations until he saw the light and joined UNSW in November 2014. His principal research interests and expertise lie in rock mechanics, theory and application, ground control and rock mass, ca rock mass calcification, design of ground support systems, numerical modelling, in addition to other areas of mining engineering, including mine design, layout, selection, geotechnical impact assessment, risk management, and advanced risk-based design and evaluation. The non-expert, I don't know what it leaves out. He's a fellow of the Austra Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, a member of Engineers Australia, the Australian Geomechanics Society, the International Society for Rock Mechanics, the Society of Mint Mining, Metall Metallurgy and Exploration, and the Bowen Basin Underground Geotechnical Society. He's also a registered professional engineer through the Queensland Board of Professional Engineers in Queensland. It's now my very great pleasure, Ismet, to invite you to the podium to deliver your inaugural lecture and the Kenneth Finley Memorial Lecture. Congratulations. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm not sure if this line is in the way. That's working. So can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's all good. All right. So uh, uh, firstly, I would like to say that um, I'm very proud to be here tonight and presenting this lecture. And I heard about this lecture for a long time, and I have attended a couple of them. Obviously, I didn't miss the last year's one that was my boss presenting, uh, uh, Mark Tefani. So it was, it was great, and it is uh, a privilege to be presenting here tonight. And thank you for coming all. I appreciate that. So what I would like to do is, is uh, tonight is I'd like to talk about grand challenges for engineering in mining. But before we get there, I'd just like to show you a couple of pictures of myself. This is me, and I'm sort of, uh, even forgot to say that I'm a hands-on engineer. So I like to get dirty, go on the ground and do my stuff. So it's a couple of pictures. Here I am when I was, uh, was it when I was a young MSc student, and there with my boss uh, doing seismic monitoring, in the platinum mines doing seismic monitoring and coal, and here finally uh, last year at uh, at, at Anglo American uh, Government Project, uh, working in the drifts with the, with the TBA. So it was great and being uh, hands dirty, and I learned a lot as well. And uh, when I tell all my students these days, get your hands dirty, go to operations, and learn other things, where this is what I mean. I hope they will understand me tonight. So the purpose of tonight's uh, presentation is that uh, since I joined uh, UNSW in November, uh, in, sorry, in December, a lot of people ask me what are the needs of the you know, uh, uh, mining industry? Uh, how, what can we do to help the mining industry? It is really sort of, it's a very broad area, and there are a lot of other engineering disciplines in the mining that they do work more than the mining engineers, right? So if you look at uh, 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 industrial research funding such as APAF, I think. There are way more uh, uh, engineering projects, other engineering from other <coughs> disciplines, than there is for mining. So therefore, I said I will like to present something within the Faculty of Engineering, and then talk to talk to the friends and tell them what what we can do together. And then I sort of brought this idea, and Paul and uh, Bruce several of us suggested maybe I should use this opportunity to to express my uh, sort of thinking around where the challenges are in the mining engineering uh, or in mining industries. And then I would love to also demonstrate to students that there are a lot, there are a lot of other uh, unsolved issues in the mining industry. So when people tell you uh, mining industries are getting smaller or there are no jobs, uh, that's what we do. through. You will see tonight, hopefully you will see tonight, there are a lot of areas where you can work, and there are a lot of areas unsolved at the moment that is waiting for you to solve. And I'm positive that uh, uh, some of you at school get there and solve, solve some of those problems. So, but I was inspired by the great work done uh, by National Academy of Engineering uh, in the US. What they did was they established a panel to look at the grand challenges for engineering. For all engineering uh, around the world and and then basically provide scholarships and put this out so that you want people to work on these grand challenges. So there were 14 of them and as you can see, uh, if you haven't seen this report, it's a great report, have a, have a look at it. It's quite a detailed report. Obviously I'm not going to go through what these are, but I'd just like to go through uh, uh, the list quickly. Make solar energy economy will provide energy for fusion, develop carbon, uh, sequestration methods, manage the nitrogen cycle, provide access to clean water, uh, restore and improve urban infrastructure, advance uh, health and uh, informatics, engineering better medicines, reserve engineering the brain, prevent nuclear terror, secure cyberspace, enhance virtual reality, advance personalized learning, engineering, and engineer the tools of scientific discovery. So this is a really very important list. And you can see some of these things on the list, such as the solar energy, we still use solar energy today, but it's still not economical. And, and, uh, and this is one of the challenges that the group came up together. And there are also some interesting, interesting challenges in, in this list. If you look at uh, uh, number 10, prevent nuclear terror. 
I'm sure 70 years ago, 60 years ago, when I started developing the nuclear, uh, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, I couldn't think that it was going to cause the problem that 70 years later, it is going to be one of the grand challenges of, of engineering. So, which was, uh, which was, uh, it's not a surprise, obviously, because uh, you know what's happening around the world. But anyway, so uh, these are the grand challenges for engineering. But there are also greatest engineering achievements uh, of the 20th century, and then the list is even bigger, bigger than what it was. So there are 20 in this list, and I'm not going to go through that. But if you look at them, they're really, really significant achievements, and I'm sure the young students here are worrying very Facebook. Fortunately, the Facebook is not there, but there are others, and they are really, really important that we take granted to die, they have been developed by engineers and invented by engineers, and that is a great thing uh, for engineering. Uh, August, I do have my list as well, but she is uh, not, not dissimilar to this. Uh, I didn't come up with 14 grand challenges, I came up with less challenges. But I like to talk about the mining methods for nine miners if there are any uh, uh, in the audience. So it's not going to be long, very, very short. There are two distinct mining methods. You either go underground and you do this mining on surface. So for underground mining and surface mining, you probably all know uh, what is involved in both. So it's, as I said earlier, in underground mining, you go underground. In surface mining, you start extracting the ore from surface. Uh, so underground mining methods are naturally supported, artificially supported, and unsupported. So these are the, the, the three critical uh, mining methods that, uh, that we implement today in different, different commodities. Roman pillars is almost common in, in, uh, in all commodities, sub-level and upper, uh, and long hole open, uh, uh, long hole open uh, uh, mining methods is also uh, are used. Around the world, artificial supported bench and field stopping, cut and field stopping, vertical, creative retreats, uh, shrink stopping, and then there's unsupported as well. Unsupported are just you know, usually sub level, normal uh, mining and block cable. So you let it run to, to fail, uh, uh, and then you don't support it. You want to support areas, but you need to support it. So surface mining methods, mechanical excavations, uh, and then obviously the water. Uh, water uh, Excavations, and I'm not going to obviously go through them again. But some pictures here I put together as well. They see how this is how they mine open cuts usually, and just a picture of it. So when we, when I talk about mining, people may think that mining is still in these old dark days, right? It is not. Mining is has advanced so much. I'll take you through now the list of all the advancements that that we've been through. But this is. This is, uh, well, some call good old days, some call uh, uh, early days of mining, but the technology has improved significantly. This technology improved significantly such that now we have big toys, really, really big toys that we play around. So, great, great uh, engineering achievements in mining are mechanized and capacity mining equipment. So, we have really large equipment that we play around. This is a drag line, you know what drag line is, everybody knows what drag line is. It's a carrying capacity of 250 50 tons to 300 tons uh, in one, in one uh, 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 shovel, and then it can lift it at 100, 150 meters easily. And, uh, and then there's also the long wall mines. There's a drag line and there's long wall. These long wall mines are, are almost getting fully automated. Not there yet, but getting automated. And then you learn about more of Institute Rock Failure, controlled by both the properties of the rock itself and by the law deformation characteristics of the surrounding rock masses. That was the great achievement. Now when we do designs, we or when we go down to the mines, we do designs these days. Because we know how the how rock is gonna is gonna behave. Or we should say we can estimate how the rock is gonna behave. Then we have high capacity processing plants, really like pumping out coal and iron ore and all the, all the commodities that that goes through the processing plants. It was a great achievement again. But was it enough? Probably not. We need something like, like exactly like the solar energy making it cheaper. We need uh, processing plants, uh, 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 or better processing plants. I'll go through the list just now. And safe mining practices, safety comes first. Safety is, is always is number one priority in mining. And I'll take you through some, some of the statistics, safety statistics as well. 
and hopefully you will understand what I mean. But is it enough? Yes, we can still improve it and we will improve it in mind. Ventilation and gas flow modeling, we've done a, uh, a fantastic job in coming up with these uh, thermodynamics, principle of thermodynamics and how the, the, uh, the ventilation and gas flow within the rock masses and within the mines itself. And then we achieved uh, great, uh, great models uh, out of these, uh, these uh, developments. And then we also learn environmental impacts. And then we know what we're going to do, how we're going to do to minimize the environmental impacts. Yes, we can do more, absolutely. And I'll tell you, I'll try to show you, I'll try to demonstrate where we can do more. Improved numerical modeling of rock mass behavior, particularly in block rock masses. This is uh, probably for the last uh, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, one of the achievements in my area in, in rock mechanics. But can we do more? Yes, absolutely, we can do more. So as I said to you, we have big toys these days that we play around. This is, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is the Murrumbah's long wall, but these long walls can carry each shield, can carry up to 1,700 tons of capacity. 1,700 tons of capacity means you can put three Airbus A380 lines on top of one each other, and it will be able to carry it without failing. And, or you can put 1,700 Toyota Yaris on top of one each other, and one of them will, will carry it. So they are really, really big capacity tools and equipment and machinery. And, uh, and this is uh, just a demonstration of it. I think this is the one that, uh, that Marumba uses. This is 1,750 ton capacity uh, uh, supplied by Joy. And it is, it looks really, really big and impressive. But does it require any improvements? Absolutely, yes, it does. And I'll talk about this now. And then this is the, uh, the uh, probably the biggest uh, shields in the world operating in Australia, in central Queensland. This shield weighs 63 tons, and then you need all custom-made equipment to be able to lift these, uh, lift these heavy, very heavy machinery. For those of you who know long wall mining, these shields are designed for 90,000 cycles, which means they are very long life cycle, uh, uh, shields, so they're hoping to get uh, much more out of it. Uh, and this is an angle operation where I used to work. And then you can see a dozer. Dozer is also it's a 70 ton uh, uh, a dozer. So all the trials were conducted on the surface and which were all successful. And this, this uh, long wall here extracted uh, millions of tons of coal in, in central Queensland. Uh, you also need uh, uh, a lot of other equipment as well, such as uh, this uh, uh, support carrier. It's a 70 ton carrier again and uh, and then it's a custom made. You can't have these equipment off the shelf. Even the shield support uh, the, the shield suppliers cannot supply this equipment. So you have to get it done and you have to find uh, people to able to manufacture this. And this uh, carrier the short support carrier was manufactured in Newcastle, just around the corner from here. And and it helped it helped us significantly uh, at Murumaro. And this is the 2014, okay, this is just a couple of months ago, again in America, uh, probably I'm biased slightly towards photographs where they come from, but this is the, this is the, uh, uh, what we call this EPBM, okay, the uh, importance of this EPBM is, this is the first EPBM in Queensland, the first and very successful EPBM, we drill or open up two drifts, and then those drifts are identical to the drifts that you go through a road tunnel. Okay, the same concrete liners uh, and, and same uh, strength and stability uh, uh, in the drifts. And this is a Robinson's machine, and they worked at the uh, ground mine. And this is uh, one more important thing about this EPBM. This is the biggest diameter EPBM ever worked in the mining industry, it's eight, eight meter in diameter. So never ever before attempted. Because of the requirements of the, the belts and the vehicle excess and all that, this is what we decided to go with. And then the 8, VM, 8 meter diameter EPBM uh, came from province. And also it's an inter uh, sorry, flame proof uh, EPBM as well. Right, so it doesn't matter how big your equipment is, sometimes things go wrong. And then when they go wrong, they go terribly wrong in mine, unfortunately because the equipment that we use are just gigantic, big equipment. And then when they fail, they fail big times and spectacularly. 
So this is one, uh, just one part quarter, and this is a fatigue failure, and, uh, and you can see that gigantic machine that I showed you earlier on is just lying on the ground, and there's not much you can do about this machine anymore, and this is about 100, uh, maybe just over 100 million dollars. Uh, sorry. And they don't swim either. Right? They can't swim. And uh, this is after 2010 floods, unfortunate incident, and, uh, and a lot of open cut mines were flooded. This is just uh, one of those, unfortunately, but uh, it was completely underwater. And I'm not sure what happened at the end, but uh, I bet it didn't go down well. And uh, so if I look at all these, uh, all these uh, 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 achievements in the, in the engineering and mining, there are grand challenges, still grand challenges. So number one is managing health and safety risks, okay? As I said to you earlier on, that is our number one priority. And that's our uh, responsibility to manage the health and safety and keep the, keep the workers safe under the uh, Mining productivity, reliability, and automation. That is uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems in the mining industry. And I'll talk about this now. The big time, right? Everybody talks about big time. It is becoming bigger and bigger and you're not doing much about it. Monitoring. Unfortunately, in some of the, some of the areas and some of the mining practices, we still use very premature monitoring systems. And I'll take you through some of them as much as I can tomorrow. Robotic behavior and failure mechanisms. You know, we have all these failure mechanisms, mechanisms and then we talk about them for a long time, but majority of them do not applicable to, for example, coal mining. And I'll talk about those as well. Detection of geological structures. Uh, environment and community and mine closure. That's one of the biggest challenges in, in mining industry still. Great quality and processing efficiency. And obviously, transport and port facilities that we hear every day from our colleagues in the industry that they say they have problems. So I just uh, put a couple of photographs in here. Uh, trying to demonstrate the difficult, sometimes difficult conditions that we encounter in open cuts as well as undergrounds. So uh, let's look at the safety. This is 2003, 2013, and this data supplied by source, uh, so supplied by uh, sources, safe work of Australia. So this is data, Australian data. So agriculture, forestry, just about to mention something before I go on the the mining fatalities include those that occur in coal and metal ore mining, other than gas extraction, sand and gravel quarries, exploration and support services. So this is basically everything, all gas mining, everything. So I'm not just uh, uh, presenting the mining data. So this is proportion of worker fatalities, which doesn't represent the whole picture, I'm aware of it. But I'd like to show you that mining is probably responsible for 4% of the work related facilities in Australia. And obviously, as always, in agriculture, forestry and fishing is the number one uh, 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 industry where people, more people get killed uh, more than anybody else, or any other industries. So obviously, transport costs and warehousing, construction. Well, some surprising uh, industries, in public administration and safety, I'm not sure what that is, maybe safety inspectors. Manufacturing, retail trade, mining. So even retail trade this is, appears to be more dangerous than mining, but it is not. Because uh, you need to normalize these numbers to the number of workers, which I will do just now. But anyway, so if you work in financial and insurance services, you are safe. Uh, that would surprise the insurance, insurance uh, uh, people look after themselves, obviously. Right, so safety, safety in the mining industry in 2013. But I thought about this, thought about long whether I should include the whole data, take the average, minimums and maximums and present and all that. What I'm going to show you tonight is only 2013 data for mining and other industries. If you look at it all over, for the last 10 years data, the data really doesn't change that much. Yes it does, and then mining goes one up and comes down over the years. But it is along the same lines. So, if you look at the fatalities per 100,000 workers, which really represents the actual 
actual risks to, to employees. <coughs> uh, you look, we look at agriculture, forestry, and fishing, still way, way high. So they got about 15 fatalities under uh, 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 over 100,000 uh, workers, which is really in, in, in any language is a bit high. It is going over the limits. So the limits, what is the limits? Well, there's a lot of, uh, lot of acceptable risk limits. I'm not going to go through uh, those, but mining is within, within those limits. So mining sits there, as you can see, and then it is about just over three, two and a half employees per uh, 100,000 workers. Okay? And then there's others as well, and the construction and mining always get uh, 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 close. It is, I'm suspecting that it's going to change in 2014 significantly because reduced number of uh, employees uh, due to downturn and then the, the fatalities that we have in Maine and Queensland. So it may, it may change in 2014, but I think uh, it will come back in 2015 because the statistics are, are probably better and the number of employees are decreasing. So yep, coming back here, well, this, this tells you why I came to university, isn't it? <laughs> After spending on the ground so many years, so many times, I want to be in the same place, I guess. <laughs> right, so let's talk about health and safety in the mining industry. So these are some of the ideas. They are not exhaustive. Okay? These are the ideas that I've got from, for example, in this case, a ACOM, or from my own experience. So if I look at the problems, by the way, this is a, this is a, a explosion test lab, a Columbus Force test lab, uh, off CSR in South Africa, in Pretoria. So they, they blast these things, and it's just amazing to see how it goes. Uh, anyway, so going back to my list, detection, prediction, selection, and design of systems to control spontaneous combustion, ignition, explosions, outburst, ventilation, and strata. Improving equipment operator interfaces and collision avoidance improve automation and remote monitoring and controls. Better controls for airborne contaminants, e.g., dust and diesel emissions, and noise exposure uh, by attenuation. Protection and removal of personnel from hazardous situations. General improvement to the health and safety of mining and mining uh, maintenance operations. So, this is the list, and I'll talk about a little bit more. So this is one of the initiatives that Anglo-American initiated uh, uh, in, in South Africa. The research is being done, conducted in, in the US. But one of the most difficult or the risky times to get into a, a platinum or gold panel in South Africa is after the blast. And then what they decided, okay, we will go to uh, our partner university, and uh, unfortunately not going to study Mark. But uh, in the US, and then develop these vehicles to put it into the panels so that they can get all the signals, all the dangers that may exist in the panels and then warn the crews. Which is a, which is a great thing. I'm not sure if it's going to work in coal mines, so the vehicles is just too small for us. So this is a, uh, this is a, a factory. Now I'm going to talk about productivity, reliability and automation. This is a factory. Now when it comes to mining, everybody talks about Toyota. Okay? And then my, my boss talked about Toyota as well. Well, my son likes BMW, so I decided I'm going to put a picture of BMW from the UK. So this is a, this is a manufacturing BMW manufacturing plant from the UK. And why I'm showing you this is because look at the systems around here. Their failure modes or the failure priorities are extremely low. And their productivity, reliability, and automation are probably top of the, top of the engineering that you can find. Uh, together with the obviously the aircraft engineering. But everything works in, in a harmony and everything works. Okay? So you don't have to you don't have to sort of uh, uh, deal with the issues that we deal. Now this is a factory, this is an underground mine, and this is a really, really good one and operates in Queensland. If I look at these two pictures, well it looks simpler to me, this mining than that, but it is not the case, unfortunately, because we have a lot of other systems in the mining, and they all work separately. I mean, I've been involved in many equipment designs and mine designs and, and, and other designs, 
They are not designed as an integral part. They all design separately. And, and you design a lawnmower gear, and then somebody comes and designs the belt for you. Okay? And then you tell them, this is my productivity expectations, and they design it for you. They're not really compatible in terms of the reliability because they come from, majority of them come from uh, uh, different suppliers. Well, if I go back to here, when if they fail one in 10,000, probably, I'm just guessing numbers here now, in manufacturing of BMW, it is probably a bad number for them. Well, these things fail all the time. You fix one, the other one fails. You fix another one, the other one fails. So you need to be able to let like these things work in harmony. And sometimes they do, most of the times they don't. What I would like to show you, this is, a, this is what we used to use uh, at Anglo American, and it's called DuPont, uh, DuPont uh, Delays Analysis. So you look at uh, uh, two or three different delays, and the important ones here are the unplanned uh, delays and planned delays. And this is a good week. This is a good week. Now let's just look at one of the unplanned downtimes 29.6 hours previously. This is last week. And this week is 41 hours. Right? 41 hours is, is, is virtually four shifts. Okay? So two days of production is done. And these ones operate on two to three million dollars a day. So this graph shows you that you know, week after week, there is this unplanned life. The, the worst thing that you can do to your operation, as far as I'm concerned, is to have these unplanned devices and, and have these, these issues. And that's not the only one. There are other issues as well. But if you look at, uh, if you go down and then look at the unplanned maintenance downtime, well, when you look at it, you say, what is unplanned maintenance time? Well, the guys start fixing things and then they find out more things to fix, right? And then the maintenance time extends. And then there is unplanned operational downtime as well. This is when you got cutting, things go wrong. So there's a the heap of list. So, but I'm not going to go through this. And then there is a planned downtime. Now, I would like to, I like you, I like to show you that. Look at the unplanned, unplanned uh, uh, downtimes versus the planned downtimes. There is unplanned are greater than planned downtimes. And this is not uh, this similar in other operations. Right? So we set these these targets for the mines, and then we keep increasing these targets. And then some mines do keep up with those targets, some cannot. If you look at the individual systems in this mine probably, or these mines, you have the belts, you have the ventilations, you have the failures, you have technical failures, you have other failures that stop you. Okay? It's not only at the face, but it, there are other things that uh, can stop you. So if I look at this uh, picture here, this doesn't happen in this factory. They don't like this to happen because they do have proactive, proactive maintenance schemes. They do have proactive monitoring schemes. We'll show you some of the monitoring things we do and the, the monitoring uh, uh, capabilities that we can improve. So, but before I get there, big data. Well, it's not really that big in mining, but it is still a big issue. We can't deal with geological information. We drill so much holes, we collect so much data, but when it comes to uh, picking up that data and analyzing it, well, we fail. We fail big times. The data is there, the data is in paper format, the data is, is with somebody else. You have to call it solid. So we don't look after our data. And I think in this uh, 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 21st century, in this new age, and we know how we're gonna, how we're gonna deal with the data, we should have more uh, ownership of the data and operations. Uh, what are they? Geological information, seismic information, monitoring data, whether it's geotechnical, whether it's ventilation, gas, dust, water. Uh, equipment, health and productivity and efficiency. That's what I was talking about before. We collect tremendous amount of data. Tremendous amount of data from equipment, from continuous miners, from long walls. And then, unless otherwise you go to a manufacturer and tell them, well, can I have a look at this data? They tell you, there it is, have a look at it. And then they give you something huge that you can't even sort out in your little computer. So we get the data, but we don't, uh, we don't use it to come from information, knowledge, and wisdom, right? As far as I'm concerned, I think mining industry is somewhere between information and data right there. 
So we can do a lot of improvements in our data management. Yes, go and talk to mining companies that all tell you that we have data management systems, but how effective they are, I don't know. I haven't seen one very, very effective yet. It takes a really long time to be able to get even simple data. Equipment, uh, yeah, talk about equipment, health, productivity, and efficiency, and surveying data. Well, go and talk to surveys. I they think they've got everything. Everything is just, is in in, uh, in great format. But you know, when you want to go back to 20 years before, and oh yeah, the data is here and there. The format is different. The, we used to use different uh, 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 format at the time, and so so on, so on. And obviously, we collect a lot of information from processing as well. So. Uh, it is something that we need to really deal with. Uh, monitoring and instrumentation. I'm not going to go through this list. This list is, is, uh, is quite quite long why we do that. Uh, why we do uh, monitoring. We have really high tech monitoring systems. Well, as high tech as, as anything you can think of. We'll show you a couple of them. But we still have these premature, uh, still wooden crack meters, we call them, so that the guys can go up there and see that. So we collect the data, how we collect them, we use satellites, even we do satellite monitoring today in Mars. So there's a lot of high tech stuff uh, that we use, and then we use uh, radars, we get a lot of radar data, but yet again, when it comes to the miner, he still goes and relies on this, because we collect the data, we sometimes fail to transfer that to, to the people underground. And this is a uh, a software that was developed, and that's a great, uh, great development for a lot of the miners who know that. It's called LDA, and, and it's, it basically gives you real time all the pressures that low wall face, all the failures, and what whatever can can go, whatever can go wrong. So yes, now uh, what we can do is still premature compared to other industries. Now I just want to go back here. Do you think they use telltales in these equipment? They we use with the wires and then takes a long time to install and then you get only four points. I don't think so. I don't really think so. So we need more more uh, instruments to be able to measure what the ground does, what the ventilation does. We need to be able to come up with proactive monitoring uh, and improvements. Uh, our monitoring is not unfortunately proactive, it's rather reactive. So we need more improvements in that. Equipment performance monitoring is rarely done. But it is done, but nobody collects the data, analyzes it, looks at the bottlenecks, looks at the, the other indicators in the data. So we need to be able to look at this, look at those. Environment, environmental monitoring, uh, or environment monitoring, mainly strata and gas and, and ventilation. Uh, it is done uh, extensively, but yet again, don't try to collect the data. Well, I've done it so many times, I know how it works. You tell the geotechnical engineer, can I have this data? He presses the button, boom, program crashes. So that's the best we have, right? So it doesn't work. And uh, uh, improve underground stability monitoring using advanced technologies we call quite radars. We have these radars. Why don't we have underground radars? What I said, I was presenting this a uh, couple of years ago, I think back, and I mentioned the same thing. Why don't we have radars? And I heard that one Italian radar company is working on it now, which is, which is great news. And then we have satellites. We use a lot of satellite monitoring these days. And I'm sure. Uh, uh, Dan is sitting there, and then he, they use uh, uh, Altamira for satellite monitoring to look at the subsidies and environmental impacts, and it's a great tool. But these great tools are really isolated; they are not they are not used every day. You have to pay a lot of money to get some isolated data. Anyway, so going back to my expertise, rock based behavior and failure mechanisms, we have uh, numerical models really improve significantly. However, we need the fire mechanisms. Now, today we all go underground, or today we go to the surface, and then we try to observe the conditions, we try to understand what's happening in the rock mass. What we observe is strains, not stress. We can't see the stress unless otherwise it manifests itself by fire the rock. But yet again, all our design methods are based on, on stress based uh, uh, criteria. Uh, we know laboratory tests very well. I mean, I, I can. You have 10 students here, put them in the lab, they will be able to do fantastic lab tests. So what do you do with this with those tests? Well, as geotechnical engineering, not much, unless otherwise we convert it back to all my strengths and then do 
all these empirical moldings so that we can use them. And, um, and then we can, we can use them in some models, but they are limited. Uh, more realistic models are emerging, so we have really these models are getting uh, uh, very, very detailed, extensively detailed, into the 3D finite elements and boundary elements. And, uh, but there are so many assumptions in them, we don't even know what they are. Most numerical models don't know what they are. And so we need to work on those and then develop those, uh, those input parameters uh, or simplify them somehow. The whole rock burst phenomenon is not well understood. Well, I'll show you a couple of photographs of that. It is amazing what this rock burst or coal burst can do to the operations. Time to failure of rock is probably one of the most challenging questions. Okay, we all try to estimate it, but we don't have a model that tells us this rock is going to fail under these conditions over this period of time. So we have some of those models are here. You can see this is a 3D boundary element model for the whole mine. You can see we will model the neighboring mines to be able to understand the stress distributions. But yet again, they are elastic models. We need inelastic models. So coal burst in the site it's a big, big, big issue. This one, this accident was in the United States in 2014. Two miners were killed. We had a similar incident in, in Australia in 2014. At one of the mines just around the corner where two people were killed. And when you look at them, they are not this similar. This was, uh, was a big rock burst uh, uh, incident in South Africa. And, uh, and it, it, when it does occur, it really, really uh, causes significant damage, significant damage to the mine and then very, very high risk as well. So if I look at only China, only China, we're doing research on this and hopefully we'll have, uh, we'll find out uh, very soon whether we like the project or not from it up. But we looked at China. In China, only last year, there were 60 coal burst related fatalities, only in coal mines. So coal burst, rock burst is a sudden fire of, of, of the rock mass. And it is not, it is not a random phenomenon. Mining induced seismicity cannot be a uh, random phenomenon because there's only one reason for it and that's mining. What is random about it is you don't know where and when it is going to happen. So we need to improve more techniques and systems and seismic monitoring technologies to be able to understand and predict these, uh, these events. Identification of geological structures. Well, one of the most highest risk for a long haul mine or for any mine for that matter is unexpected structures, unexpected large structures. And they cause, they can cause significant down times for any operation, any operation. So what we need to do is we need to be able to come up with tools that can pick up, uh, that can pick up uh, 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 these anomalies. A couple of photographs, uh, sorry, pictures here. You can see there's a pole going through and, uh, and then we do pick up some of them. And CSRO uh, has done a fantastic job, but I think uh, they will continue doing that looking at the seismic tomography. So they are putting geophones ahead of the long wall face and then using the shear as a source and then looking at how the, how the seismic waves travel within rock masses, which is a, which is a, which is a great uh, uh, invention. But it still requires a lot of work. It's not done and needs to be done. So what they do is they can cause you significant issues in the long wall face. Look at that. This is a, a dike. Yes, in this case it was expected, it was known. But if it comes to, to long wall, and it does happen very often, it can cause significant problems to the long wall phase. Or for that, uh, any other, other mining, uh, mining operation for that matter. So they are really, really risk, risk for operations. Environment, community and mine closure. Nobody wants to see these symbols appearing in the housing. Well, I wouldn't like it. I, don't, I bought a house in Newcastle myself uh, in 2006 when we moved out. The first thing we, I did was went to Cobalt and I picked up all the mine plants because everybody is under mine. Okay? And uh, so I don't want it, nobody wants it. So we need to be able to come up with tools to able to understand the long term stability of these workings. Well, these workings are 100 years old, some of them, some of them 50, 60 years old. So we need to be able to understand and come up with tools that stabilizes these old workings. Groundwater is another problem. Surface, uh, equus, surface water is another problem that we need to investigate and understand more. I mean, as uh, you and I you, 
It's full of mining engine, we're doing a lot of work around groundwater and surface water and ecosystems, but we can do more. We can, we can uh, uh, develop new techniques and, and methods to be able to reduce our impacts on the environment. And wildlife and contamination of soil and obviously the tidings. Tidings are, you know what the tidings, uh, failures are, are not just not welcome. Okay, this is, a, this is in South Africa and this is a, uh, as I always say, it's a golf course with big holes in it now. And this is not something that the miners should do. This is not what we want to do. And we need to be able to learn our lessons and don't leave the environment like this. Today, we don't do things like this. Today, we have better system, way better understanding of how the substance impacts uh, or how the mining impacts the substance and substance impact, impact, impacts the environment. But still, there are a lot of areas where we can improve our understanding. And sinkholes, these are really, really terrible things as well, and we don't want those. And they don't appear. But if there are virgins, uh, 100 years old, what do you do? You have to deal with them. And you need to be able to develop tools to, to deal with these. And you hear about these sinkholes appearing in Ipswich, in, in Brisbane, in, in Newcastle, even in, the, in further down in south. So we need to be able to develop our tools. There's a, not only coal mines, the big zinc, mid zinc mines also cause these big, gigantic substances. And, and we need to be able to stop uh, these kind of operations, which we do today, luckily. So, fires. This is 2014. <coughs> Hazelwood uh, 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 mine down in Victoria, and they had a fire. And look at, look at this. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like something like this. So we need to be able to uh, come up with, with ideas and tools to, able to stop these, uh, these kind of environmental impacts. And we will. And obviously there's similar pictures here. I don't want to show too many negative pictures. Some positive pictures. Right, this is after the 2010 floods. Right, some in your way to good ideas. Right, there was so much water in operation. So much, so much uh, uh, water everywhere basically. So they had to get rid of this water. They couldn't pump into the rivers. So what they did, they developed these uh, 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 big fans so they put the, put the water in the air and, and uh, evaporating, evaporating water in significant amounts, which was probably a safe way of doing that. Right, so some, some of those pictures here, but there were a couple of those that operated again up in, up in Queensland. Great quality processing efficiency. This is uh, this is one of the great areas as well as the mining investment declining and operations are maturing. They are becoming lower quality, which requires fine grinding and great drops off. Grinding is probably the most expensive processing unit. I mean, I was talking to one of my colleagues this morning, and she was referring to something like five to six percent of the energy uh, generated in Australia goes to those processing grinding grinding processes. So they really hungry uh, our processes. Optimizing the process efficiency of individual unit operations. Detecting and eliminating dynamic coal losses. Optimizing maintenance practices, equipment designs to deliver improved processes, efficiencies at lower costs. Sustainability in the plants as well, and probably more importantly in plants. Improve health and safety outcomes, reduce environmental impacts and water management. Water management is one of the projects that as UNSW School of Mining Engineering we are interested to do in, as part of our ACAP project. Development of new processing technologies that are higher capacity, lower cost, or more efficient. Deployment of existing technologies and approaches from other industries and, uh, 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 sorry, where was I? Existing technologies and approaches from all us in a coal specific context, and obviously automation of mobile equipment in coal, mineral, and mineral handling applications such as doors and pushes, just as an example. So, this is a normalized uh, grade graph uh, from source from CRC, as you can see, the grades are pretty uh, easy. Well, I'm not a transport engineer, I'm a, I'm a mining engineer, so I wouldn't know about uh, transportation and, and port facility plants, but we always hear about these, and we used to hear about the mines as well. So the areas that I think where we need to improve our, our engineering uh, input is efficiency, loading of valence, 
of trains, efficiency modeling of train runs, spontaneous combustion for coal mines during transportation, and obviously the landing at ports and at port trains. I think this is it from me. And in conclusions, there are still major interim challenges in the mining industry that require urgent solutions. And no doubt that UNSW has the best expertise to be able to assist the mining industry and the world. So some acknowledgements. Uh, thanks to UNSW for giving me this opportunity and the Faculty of Engineering, obviously. School of Mining Engineering, Professor Jim Garvin will help me significantly. Dan, my friend, thank you for coming and, uh, and being with us tonight. And Chun from CSL and Seher helped you with the processing. And Joy Global, Anglo American Minerals Council of Australia, and my wife and, and son, Sensor and Toba. Thank you all. just your colleagues, but your, not your colleagues from the university, but colleagues in the industry and also students from the school. We've had a very interesting path from Turkey to South Africa to Brisbane. You have to leave Brisbane in there. And, and, and then to Sydney. Um, I, was really, I really like the picture of the black coal on the face. That was, that's, that's all our academics do that at UNSW. We all go underground. Um, but I think it's something that's, that's special about the mining field. It's, it's very difficult to find someone in mining who's moved up through their career but hasn't actually started down there on the site. And I think it's one of the reasons that the, the, the field, and you call it almost the, the discipline, has been so successful and so self-sustaining, is its ability to take the people coming through and find places for them to actually work right down there on the site. The other thing that we sometimes don't realise is just how significant mining has been for the advancement of society. Look at everything we do, the energy we use, the materials we use to make everything we have, and it's all come, really all of it has come out of the ground through mining. And the ability to actually mine materials sustainably, to mine them safely, to mine them in a way that's actually cheap, cheap has actually been fundamental to the advancement of our society where we are today. And it's, it's really interesting, particularly in this man's talk there, to just see the significance of technology when it comes to mining. And when I talk about it, I wouldn't actually say, I, I struggle to actually grasp what is mining engineering as a discipline, because the discipline itself is the, is the ability to take technologies, every discipline around, and actually apply them to a really significant, significant part of what we actually do. I was just interesting, you, you talked about numerical modelling. I mean, numerical modelling actually began in the aircraft industry, it moved into the biomedical industry, and then it's used somewhere else where, where safety and being able to actually accurately predict is so important that it's really interesting to see that the really significant transition into the mining industry. Now it's moving into big data. Big data's been moved, it's moving everywhere, but the whole ability to collect data and manage it. The, the monitoring comes similarly, to be able to take the data that's monitored and actually be able to be able to use that. And then you sort of show some of the how important it is to avoid failures, those sinkholes, the hazelwood fire, uh, the really significant things that as an industry they have to make one stand up and think we still have a lot of work to do, and you articulated that very well, Elizabeth. But the thing that's, that really stands out in you your presentation and some of your pictures and moving through. It's just the amazing job that the industry has done in regards to safety. You look at the, how dangerous mining was even 50, 80 years ago, and then look at the statistics that you present, where mining, I'm quite sure, would have been way over the top of agriculture, etc. And now it's actually become, in terms of what it does, a, a quite, a, quite a safe industry. And it's, I think, something that it's a culture that's gone through, it's, and it's, it's been a transition, and I think that's actually really significant. But finally, Ismet, it was a great presentation. I really liked the way, and your career transition from right down there on the mine site through to actually an academic year, doing research, teaching other engineers, and also to be able to show your picture next to the EPVM, the largest in the mining industry. It basically shows that you can do it all. 
We do do robots here. Our robots are actually, if you can do big robots, big and tiny melons, so we, we have to look at that. So without any further ado, I think we should sort of recognise the significant stage that Isbeth reached in his career. And before everyone goes, I'd like to call on Professor Ian Martin, Deputy Vice Chancellor, to say a few closing remarks. Um, Ismet, once again, congratulations on being able to deliver your inaugural lecture. It's a privilege for us to have you here at UNSW, and we really look forward to working with you over the next few years. Um, just a couple of words before we close. I was struck by your introduction into the impact of engineering on the world, and particularly your <coughs> focus on how we make mining safer. I probably come from one of the few families where in telling your parents that you want to be a doctor was a disappointment. My father was an engineer, and his retort to me was, why waste your time? You're going to save far more lives being an engineer than you ever will being a doctor. And I don't think he ever forgave me, and I think if I ever wanted a reminder about that, I got it tonight. I'd like once again, congratulations, Ismet. It's a wonderful achievement and a wonderful career where we see you bring your practical skills to the university, and then what you learn from the research bench back into the practical world of mining. It's what we're about as a university and exemplifies our motto of Manoet Mente. Congratulations, Ismet.